Good afternoon, Mr. Palmer. How are you, sir? It's a fine Friday. Or it is a fine Friday, except for the fact that we're supposed to be getting like 18 feet of snow over the weekend. So I'm I'm full on into my my mountain man mode. I got my, the long hair. My kids would say they're jealous of you. Not not for the mountain man thing, but for the snow. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, hopefully you don't lose power like you did last weekend, and that wasn't even snow related. I don't think. Yeah, it wasn't. But um, you tell them if they're jealous, they can come shovel it because it's supposed to be <laughs> no, wet and heavy. Come on, do you think kids these days know how to shovel? I'll tell you what. When I was a, when I was a kid, one of the best snowstorms we ever had. We had so much snow that we had to go up on the roof and shovel the snow off because we were afraid the roof was going to collapse, and so. So that was being a kid, being like, hey, take the snow shovel, go up on the roof to shovel the snow <laughs> off is actually kind of a, you know, you're just like, how often are you ever told to do that, right? Never. So, so, <laughs> well, the cool part was, you know, we, there was this corner of the roof where they kind of like came in together and we, and so you pile all the snow on there and the pile of snow reached the top of the roof. It was kind of fun. And so then we jumped off the roof into the snow again, as a kid, you know, as a teenager, you're just like, this is the coolest thing ever. And it was really cool until you realized it's you're really now dangerous. like, neck, now you're like neck deep in snow and you can't get out. <laughs> well, there's that too. <laughs> well, it wasn't that dangerous because the drop was really only like a foot. I mean, it Don't was try much this more home, kids. Yeah. Don't recommend it. Let's just, let's just no more, no, no more snow jumping. I, like that might explain a lot. Okay. But we're not a snow jumping podcast as everybody so, hopefully knows by now. But I will tell you, though, because it all comes down to the circumstances, right? If the circumstances all line up right, you can jump off your roof into the snow. That's perfectly fine. You can do that. See, now, if circumstances... I would jump off the roof into the snow and I would find the spot that had like the four foot bird feeder in the four foot two inch drift. Well, you have to again you have to know your environment you have to and so this is really kind of fun right because believe it or not this ties into today's episode oh i'm so I'm you, loving this segue I, I have no <laughs> idea where we're going but anyways so so yeah so but it ties in because you have to know that like i can jump off the roof into a big giant pile of snow as long as there's not a four foot bird feeder with a giant metal spike on the top of it that you're going to impale yourself on because that's bad right so we but we know that we know that with age we know that with experience as we go along we know this kind of stuff and that's kind of you know so today is our um our episode number three in our 10 part series on things that we think you should know or you need to know about wi-fi and um and so just like jumping off the roof into the snow you know now let's let's go back a little bit and we're going to, so the first, the first one was the client's always in charge, which believe it or not, um, was a big topic in my week this week. So again, this is not just something that we're doing for, you know, just random people. I mean, this is a big thing. So that was a topic this week. Um, the last one was more is not always better. Unless you're drum jumping off the roof <laughs> into a big giant pile of snow, then more is probably better, but it's not always. So this week, for this episode, we're going to go with what are the requirements? So just like jumping off the roof into the snow, right? The requirements are, one, you got to have enough snow so that you don't break your legs. Two, you have to know where the big bird feeder is with the big metal pointy spike on the top so you don't impale yourself on it. So there's a requirement. And number three, you have to be kind of young enough to realize that it's a really bad idea to do that anyway. But don't, as long don't as forget, you get, Don't forget four. What, what's for? You have to be under the influence to be stupid enough to do it if you're not young enough. Uh, well, oh, so um, uh, I have three different stories I could tell that would take us <laughs> way off the rails. And stories and I was sober. For, I, was still, I was sober for all three. So anyway, um, <laughs> so that's, <laughs> but again, what are the requirements? Just like, you know, jumping off the roof into snow, just like anything else with Wi-Fi. That is one of the big primary things we talk about all the time is what are the requirements? And it's funny because I wrote a guide um, a few years ago, actually, and they'd, they'd asked me to write it specifically for a specific like vertical, you know, they're like, hey, we want a guide that talks to us about 
you know, how we design Wi-Fi in an elementary school. And they're like, we want you to talk about that. And they're like, we want you to go really far in depth. And so I did. And I send the, I get the document done, I send it off and they come back and they go, and they go, you spend the first part of it talking about the requirements. And they're like, but it's, that's not any different between a K-12 and say a hotel or, you know, carpeted enterprise or anything else like that. And they came back and they were like, why did you do that, Jim? And I said, well, because for every single Wi-Fi network that we do, we always have to start with what are the requirements? And so that's why I cover it is because personally to me, doing Wi-Fi, designing Wi-Fi, especially for a new network, gathering what are the requirements is probably the hardest aspect of Wi-Fi in general. And I mean, I don't know where, about you. Th this is where the, the, the infamous, if not notorious statement really comes into play. And you laugh because you know exactly what I'm going to say, but this is the famous, it depends. This is absolutely, as, as anybody wants to sit there and say, oh, you're being a, a, a you know, a insert yeah. inflammatory <laughs> comment here. It really does depend on what you're trying to do or what the client is trying to do with the network you're deploying. You know, if there are no SLAs, I could deploy the absolute worst <laughs> network on earth, but as long as it works, that it works. I gave you a working wireless network. You didn't tell me it had to be good. You didn't tell me it had to be fast. You didn't have to tell me that it had to be frictionless. You didn't tell me that you needed a guest portal. These are all the requirements. And um, it, there are engineers out there, not just wireless engineers, but there are engineers out there who loathe this part of the job. But there is a reason why, and it's it's covered in every wireless <laughs> test, exam, whatever you want to call it, that I've, I've seen. CWNA, RCWA covers it. Um, I'm pretty sure CWDP adds it, the design documents, the design process. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a matter of picking up your tools and walking the site and going, okay, there's some, you know, snap a picture here, snap a picture there. I'm taking some measurements. It's sitting down and talking with the, user, the users, I can't talk today, and finding out what their requirements are. And if mm -hmm. you don't, if you fail to talk to the users, you set yourself up to fail. Because there's going to be that corner case where so-and-so in the warehouse has those five 2.4 gigahertz Zebra scanners that are absolutely <laughs> crucial to day-to-day -day operations. And your client who just brought you in for a survey and deployment said no 2.4 gigahertz anywhere at all, period, end of discussion. And you get there day one and the warehouse is on fire because their scanners don't work. You know, I tell a story about in my last job. I got this request and it said they needed Wi-Fi. And I kept trying to have this conversation. I kept trying to say, okay, we need to talk about this. You know, what is it you, and they just, and all they would ever, they, they refused to meet with me. They wouldn't take my phone calls. My emails would just come back and be like, look, we don't understand what's so difficult. You, we, we told you we need Wi-Fi. You need to give us Wi-Fi. And so I did, I built an SSID. I deployed it onto their AP that was covering their space and that was it. And then I closed the ticket. Now I got in a whole lot of trouble because, um, that SSID didn't go anywhere. It just, <laughs> it was just, it was just Wi-Fi, you know? And it was like, and so like, it did, there was no DHCP, there was no VLANs, there was <laughs> like, there, it was just an SSID. And so I closed the ticket and man, I got in so much trouble because they come back and they're like, but it doesn't work. And I'm like, well, you didn't ask me for that. You just asked and said, we need Wi-Fi. So I gave you Wi-Fi. So, and like I said, you said that this is the part of the process that most engineers loathe the one that we, because it is the hardest one. It's the hardest one because a lot of times our customers, the end users have never really thought about it and said, what is it that I need my Wi-Fi to do? They just kind of look at it and they just go, I need Wi-Fi, but Wi-Fi that does what, you know, are we getting, are we talking to the internet and just the internet? Are we talking about talking to an internal server or just the internal server? There's all these other things that come into that, that sort of help, help us as the designers, as the engineers design and come up with these networks and say stuff like, Hey, yeah, we need to prioritize 2.4. You know, I think everybody has that story of, you know, doing a network where they sort of deprioritize 2.4 only to find out later that, oh yeah, there's one critical piece, whether it's a, you know, my, my story is it was a brand new phone that they bought for the, this entire department that only did 2.4. It didn't do five gig. No. And so, 
<laughs> again, it's like, what are the requirements? But because the customers haven't thought about this ahead of time, we go in and it's, and it's like, I have to spend two, two days of my time at the customer site going through this before I even start to get pictures of or get floor plans and draw walls and take measurements and do all the other things I need to do. I can spend days talking about this to make sure that the network I design and the network that ends up eventually being deployed meets your requirements. And so that is really, and that's why people are like that because, and it, and like I mentioned with the K-12 stuff, every single design should, I probably should put should <laughs> always start here. And if it doesn't, you can usually tell it because you'll end up coming back to this step after the deployment's done. When you start to troubleshoot and be like, well, why? Do, and to your point, why does the Zebra scanners not work? You know, the warehouse is in chaos. So you're going to get to this step. Question is <laughs> how far into the process you are before you get to this step. And, and so it should. It should. And, and, and there's there's a, a litany of reasons why. And one of the, the good ones, and again, it comes up on multiple certification exams. It's If it's not a question, it's certainly a study topic and it could come up. Um, and I say that for reasons that I just got done doing one, but you need this in part for the scope of the project, because not only is it going to keep you on task with building the network that is being asked of you, but it's also your source of truth to go back to the customer when they say, you didn't build what we asked. And you say, here's the document that says I did. This is what well, you here, showed here's this the is what you talked about. You reviewed here's, it. It's in the letter of the, you know, the word it, of, of, or whatever, you know, the, the, the public record, if you will. And but it's, it's a list of, this is what you asked for. Yes, exactly. You, and you asked for this. This is, this is, so it's, 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 it is literally, we built what you asked for. I mean, it, it's and a perfect you, example. You have to, and, and I will say this from a personal experience that I had sc scars with. And I actually was talking about this with somebody earlier this week. I had a job. And a customer, they wanted a warehouse design. I said, I need to know square footage. I need to know the, the footprint. I need to know the floor plan. Okay, they showed me the shell. They said it's going to be, you know, like 100 by 300 feet or whatever. I said, okay, but I need the shelving. Oh, we don't know the shelving. Well, I can't do design. Oh, you got to just give us a guess. I said, I can't. I said, it's going to be wrong. And they're like, well, do your best. I'm like, you don't understand. Like, if I guess, I'm going to put my, <laughs> I'm going to put hours into the design, and I'm probably going to be wrong. And I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they came, you know, they, I did the design. They came back. I, you know, had the, the shelves going north, south. They were going east, west. And then, so then I adjusted it. <laughs> and then they were like, well, no, we're only going to do like half the building with shelves. So I adjusted it again. I did like four or five designs. Had exhausted all the time we thought was going to be needed for the project. And of course, they, they still weren't happy. And I was like, I'm done. You guys want to build it, design it yourselves, whatever. Um, had backup from my, my, my VP at the time. But, you know, it's, you need that document. You need them to, to put what, is out there because otherwise it's just, a, it's a, it's a, it's a guessing game. It's a crapshoot. And, um, it's going to drive yourselves nuts as, as engineers. It might be the part of the job that's not fun. Cause you're not playing with the, the, the sidekicks or the, uh, you know, the side O's or, you know, the, whatever, Osseums, all the new toys out there for surveys and whatnot. I get it. We like playing with toys. This is not necessarily the sexiest part of the design, but this is the Consider this your foundation. If you do a horrible job at this point of the project, it is going to collapse at some point. It might not collapse right away. It might not fail during the initial deployment, but some point in time, it's going to come back and bite you in the butt. And so it's it's very imperative. And if you get this right, you know, the customer really is going to think about things that they hadn't thought of. They're going to be able to, to really build that foundation and it's going to go smoothly nine times out of 10. Um, so yeah, strongly, I can't, I can't stress this part enough. Um, because like you said, Jim, sometimes they don't even think about it. They just, you know, make Wi-Fi mm -hmm. work. Well, again, do you want, you know, bandwidth caps? Do we need a guest portal? Um, you know, what what are your requirements? You know, what is your least, what's the favorite term now? The least capable, most important, most important, least capable, whatever device. You know, that's the device you design for. Maybe there's debate about that, but you need to account yeah. for it. If, even if you're not designing for it, you have to design with you have to take the design and that into account because whether it's the five zebra scanners and you've got to build a separate networkers SSID or your executive has a, you know, a Bloomberg terminal in his office. And for whatever reason, it's on a very funky network. You need to know these things and you need to build for them. Otherwise come day one cutover, they're going to see it as a failure because their stuff didn't work. 
Well, so. it's, a, it's, it's the saying, right? How hard can it be to not install wires? <laughs> you know, Extremely. If, if you've done this more than once, you know, you, if you've only done it once, then you know that's that's wrong. But we've been talking about stuff a lot. And I want to I want to spend this some time on here because I, I don't think people give this this one enough credit. But this ties back to our first topic about the client always being in charge. That's why when I we built this list, you and I, when we sat down and we built this list, that was there like, hey, this is our number one thing is because the client is in charge. And so when we start talking about what are the requirements, we've hinted at, hinted at this a couple of times is we start talking about client types. And I think until you get into this process, most people don't think about the fact that different clients have different capabilities, which then impacts our decisions and the way we take the network when we design it. So um, one of the stories that, you know, we, we've talked about a lot is, you know, like 2.4 gigahertz only devices. That is, you know, again, everybody has a story about when you, you know, you, you have a, a customer and they're just like, oh, none of my stuff works. And you're just like, oh, it's a 2.4 only, you know, device. Great. You know, and then now we have to throw this little wrinkle in which is kind of funny when you think about it. Um, now you have devices that are, well, they're only 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. And you're like, wow, what does that mean? Well, it means they don't have 6 gigahertz. But more importantly, even within the 5 gigahertz spectrum, we still have some variabilities in there. And I like to tell a story that just happened to me recently, actually. Um, my granddaughter lives with me and her friend came over and they were talking and she kept, and she actually came to me and she goes, your Wi-Fi is terrible because my <laughs> switch, my switch, my my little handheld Nintendo Switch, because you know they each have their switch, and so they're playing Switch. And she goes, she goes, my switch works perfect at my house, but when I come to your house, it doesn't work. Your Wi-Fi is terrible, and I'm just like, um, yeah, exactly. So there's a reason why I tell this story, right? So these are. Nintendo and the Nintendo switches that we were talking about are two years old or newer, actually. And I was like, what? Because I'm like, I'm like, I turned around and I pointed and I said, I said, you see that little thing hanging from the ceiling up there? I said, with the, you know, with the green lights on it and everything. And she's like, yeah. And I said, that's my Wi-Fi. I said, so I tell you, I said, I guarantee you that my Wi-Fi is better than the Wi-Fi you have at your house. Because I know what you have and you don't have any of this stuff. And your router is actually stuck behind a TV. So I'm like, I guarantee you mine's better. But she's like, but it doesn't work. So in her mind, my Wi-Fi was worse. So I had to do a little, and we're going to show off a tool here. I had to use a tool, this part of the WLAN Pi. Um, I think this, I think we have a plan to do a, a, an episode on the WLAN Pi and kind of show this off because this is a tool we use all the time. And we talk about it but we never really show people why we use it. So today I'm going to show you why I use this tool. So this is what I did. I said, all right, come with me. So I grabbed my granddaughter switch and my granddaughter and her friend and her friend's switch. And we all traipsed in here into my office and I fired up my WLAN Pi and I went to a little tool called the profiler. So the profiler, you turn that on and it turns, it actually turns on an SSID and you connect your device to it and it fails which is fine. That's what we wanted to do. But more importantly, what happens is you start getting these profiles of devices. So now I can come down and I can say, Hey, I, and you can even run reports and you can download CSVs. You can, we'll look at the profile here in a second, but you can also download the PCAP of the association frame, because this tells us the capabilities of that client device. So in the case of my 2.4 only device, I discovered it because when I fired up the the uh, profiler tool on 5.8 gigahertz, the device could not see it. So then I fired it up on 2.4 and the device went, cool, I can see that one now. And I went, holy crap, it can't even see a five gigahertz SSID. That's why it doesn't work. But anyway, I want to start with this second from the bottom because I was, and now what this one is, is this is an Apple device. This was actually my iPhone. And what we can see down here in the supported channels, we see 36 to 64, 100 to 144, 149 to 165. So I know that my iPhone uh, is iPhone 11. So that's the channels that it supports. So cool. But when I fired up the profiler and I associated the Nintendo switches to it, 
It supports channels 36 to 64, 100 to 128, and 149 to 165. Now, we'll cut to the chase here. There's actually some channels missing because on my iPhone 15 or my iPhone 11, it went from 100, I, probably the iPhone 15, I'd have to assume, goes from 100 to 144. So we're missing a chunk of channels right here between 128 and 149. There's there's some there's some channels missing in there. So um, the other thing I'll point out real quick since we're sitting here is the 165 because, and just so you can see, this is the other switch. So the switches behave the same, but they were missing four channels right in the right sort of in the middle of the five gigahertz. So it supported five gigahertz, it supported some of DFS, but it did not. And it actually supported the actual DFS channels. But we'll get to that here in a second. One, two, three. But if we take a look at this one right here, this is a Samsung. It supports up to channel 177. So that's Uni 4. So just because it supports five gigahertz doesn't mean it supports five gigahertz. So when I take a look and we switch over to this screen right here, and this is uh, Wi-Fi Explorer Pro. If you look down here on the bottom, there's actually some channel numbers. There's 132, 136, 140, and 144. Now, once I learned and realized that the Nintendo Switch would not work on 132, 136, 140, and 144, I then jumped on my controller and I said, I want to see what channel the AP that's sitting right over top or just off to the side of where they were working. I mean, it was literally, they were in the middle of the room and the AP was over on the side of the room. And it was so, it's like 15 feet line of sight, nothing in between of them. And I looked and I went, well, what do you know? That AP is running on channel 132. <laughs> so of course my Wi-Fi was bad. Their devices couldn't connect to it. Now I, I further figured out because my granddaughter would take her switch all over the house. She was actually connected to the AP upstairs that was just good enough that it worked for her, but because her friend was coming in the front door and passed my H550. She was associated to the H550, which wasn't a great signal at the other end of the house. But because she didn't know to roam to the other one upstairs, her device was stuck on the, the wrong channel and it was just a disaster. So it didn't work. So as soon as I switched that AP from the 132, 136, 140, 144 channels, as soon as I switched that over to a different, you know, any of the other five gigahertz channels, all of a sudden she's like, wow, your Wi-Fi is awesome. It's faster than mine at house. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I wanted to hear. But it has to do with the client capabilities. So that's why we talk about these 2.4, you know, five gigahertz only clients. And now the six gigahertz only clients, you know, are, are the, the ones that have six gigahertz. And there's even a wrinkle above that that I'm working on, um, for actually for the ruckus SEs right now. Um, and I did a presentation in Prague about there are actually six gigahertz clients that have different client capabilities at six gigahertz. So again, these client types are still driving how we have to design our networks. Now, spoiler alert for those who didn't watch my presentation in Prague, um, there are two different types of six gigahertz clients. There's what's known as a dual power client and an indoor only client. Um, an indoor only client will not show you a network that is running at standard power. Now, the fun part is we don't know how to tell it. We, we have one way to tell the difference in those clients and it's super hard and time takes a ton of time. So hopefully that gets fixed. I'm hoping in the next two weeks, we might have an idea, but the client types, again, this is why, this is why we started this whole series with client types is because all of these different requirements, you know, for what clients we're going to use, because at the end of the day, if it doesn't work for that client, then the Wi-Fi is terrible. And there's, you, you cannot argue that. Now, I have to ask, and I don't know if I'm cheating and looking ahead because I really didn't look at the deck. I, we kind of flew blind today, but say I don't have a WLAN pie. There's mm -hmm. got to be a website out there that I can go to it and look up client capabilities. Now there is, and it's, it's called, uh, the, the website's clients.mikealbano.com. And I'm pretty certain that John's already going to already has the, that link in the show notes. 
But here's the thing about that website. It's a crowdsourced website. So, and it, and honestly, if you go look at it, the, the website gives is the instructions, tells you how to use the WMPI profiler for people to upload these, these client um, PCAPs so that they can then, he can maintain this list. Now, I, and I talk about this in, in my presentation in Prague, you know, his list has 250, maybe 300 different clients on there, but there's like 1600 different six gigahertz clients, different manufacturers, different models, stuff like that. There's 1600. So while there is a, a source you can go look at, it's nowhere near complete because it's all just crowdsourced. You know, Mike Albano does a fantastic job, but Mike Albano does not have 1600 clients sitting around his house that he can test all these stuff. So that's why, you know, we encourage people, Hey, if you, if you have these problems, if you can get this information, submit it to the website because not one person, not one company can have every device that is available and, to be able to figure this stuff out. And generally what happens is you figure it out when it doesn't work. And then you have to go run the profiler tool on that specific client and you go, well, crap, that's not good. And Mike's website is to allow us to share that knowledge. It'd be like, hey, here's this weird device that does these weird things that has to do. And, and there's even more capabilities around 11R. I mean, you, we saw that in the, in the profiler report where it talks about the client capabilities. We should, I'm actually going to make somebody really mad because I'm going to leave here late. But when we take a look at this profiler report, you can see that, you know, it indicates whether 11 K R V W W is very critical. That is management frame protection. And it's a requirement for WPA three, um, you know, 11 N 11 AC 11 AX, the max transmit power of the device and the number of channels. You know, and it'll tell you like, hey, how many spatial streams, which MCS rates, does it support 160 megahertz, um, single user beam forming, multi-user beam forming. You know, so you can go in and you can, it will tell you these types of things like this one right here is six gigahertz operating class is supported. So this does six gigahertz. Notice what it doesn't tell you. LPI it doesn't or SPI. It does not tell you if it's a 6XD, which is a low power indoor, or a standard power 6CD client. So again, we have all these other things you know, that it will tell you. And so that's where we crowdsource this information from. So you know, when we tell people like, hey, turn on 11K, R, and V, and you can use you know, protected management frames so that, that that's an indication almost that it, may, it probably does support WPA3 quite possibly, well, it'd have to with the six gigahertz operating class. That being supported is a is a very much, yeah, Sharon. <laughs> he finally made it onto the podcast. Sharon made it onto the podcast. <laughs> he, in my so, lunch with him, is, it's going to so, be a few minutes late. So but, one of the things I wanted to, I want to mention this while you're looking at this, and it popped in my head, you as engineers having supported customers before, having supported businesses, one of the, t the popular topics has, has always been, lately at least, BYOD versus corporate provided devices. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things is sort of maybe lost in the shuffle here is this is actually a good example of why or a good supporting cause for why you might want to do that. And I say that because if you're a corporate client and you want to support your wireless network and you want to have best in class, sit there and, and provide the devices. You, that way you know exactly. I'm, I'm always supplying everybody with an iPhone or a Galaxy S20 or whatever. Not that 20 because eventually it's going to be out of date, but maybe it is already. I'm not a Samsung guy. But you've got your standards. It's the same thing with laptops and desktops when you go to the, the company, right? Mm -hmm. They know exactly what they're supporting. They know, okay, I gave Jim a new laptop. He gets a new laptop every three years. It's going to be able to run the latest operating system. When you get into BYOD, you don't know what you're going to get. So I might have devices coming in that do support KRV. I might have devices that don't support KRV. So then I can't take advantage of it and I've got a mix and match. And it's, these are the things that, again, it goes to the requirements. People don't necessarily think about that. Um, and that's also why sometimes when companies have a corporate network and a BYOD network, they tell you right off the bat, the BYOD is best effort. We're going to make the best network we can to support as many clients as we can. But if your client doesn't work, it's BYOD. It's not functional. It's not mission critical, whatever. Uh, but this is something else, and, and this is a place you can go to. If you 
and it's part of the requirements document. It should be. What are your common devices? And if mm-hmm. they say they don't know, go into the controller. You can look into the controller, whether it's a Ruckus controller or I'm sure other vendors do the same thing. We're looking at a reporting tool. They will have they will have the device operating systems in there. The fingerprints will be there that says this is an iOS device. This is, you know, maybe it's not going to know if it's an iPhone or an iPad, but it'll say iOS device. It'll say Samsung mm-hmm. or Galaxy, um, sorry, Android. It'll be in there, and you can get an idea for how many devices are out there. And so you can see the network split, and Jim's showing the network now, but it'll show you the network split of, oh, they've got 70% iPhones, and they've got 30% Android. Okay, well, I definitely need to make sure I cater, not that I want to cater to the Apple devices, but if I'm making a decision, I want to make sure that I'm not hurting the Apple devices because that's the, the lion's share of my network, or vice versa. So it's something else to keep in mind as part of the requirements gathering. You can actually get the the device information and do this research on your own, whether you use the profiler or you look at the client site uh, that Mike Albano and the crowd put together, and you can dis- determine what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and that's really important. And again, it all goes back to requirements and gathering them the right way. So... Yeah. Sorry if I said so thunder. <laughs> no, and we I honestly don't remember where we were. What's next on here? But but yeah, so that's why you know we focus a lot. You know, and here's the six XD versus the six CD. We'll put I won't put this out here because if you're doing six gigahertz, this specification right now is not very important because everything we have is low power indoor. So whether it's a six XD low power indoor or a six CD standard power um, client device, it's going to work because six gigahertz today is low power indoor. But if you go back a couple of uh, Ruckcast episodes ago when we had uh, um, Mr. Uh, well, Mark Gibson. Mark, Mark Gibson. We had Mark Gibson on and we were talking about AFC. It's coming. And when we start talking about outdoor six gigahertz, outdoor six gigahertz is, is only standard power. You cannot run it at low power indoor because, well, it sort of violates the whole indoor part because you're outdoor. So you're required to have AFC. So if you have a six gigahertz network and you use, you know, this, the same SSI, you have one SSID and it's on six gigahertz and it's only on six gigahertz and your low power indoor client roams outside and it doesn't know about the five gigahertz network because it's not the same name and it's running WPA2. So all of a sudden that's going to be a very hard roam if it even roams at all, or if it just simply disconnects when it goes outside. So these are things that, you know, hey, what are the requirements? And when we get to AFC and outdoor six gigahertz, this is, and and that is just a whole other mess that we don't even have time for. But that's why it's like, what are the requirements? And we have to ask, we have to talk about it. So if you're a customer, I'll finish with this. If you are a customer and you are getting ready to ask somebody to be like, hey, we want a consultant to come in. We want to have our vendor come in. We want to have somebody come in and we want to start having these things. If you can do this work ahead of time and say, what are our requirements? Are we wanting indoor, outdoor six gigahertz? Are we wanting, you know, what devices do we really depend on in our business? If you can do that work ahead of time, then what your experience will be much better. Your network will be much better and it'll be a much more fluid and almost a relaxing process as you go through this, because this is not going to be a relaxing thing. So the more you can do to help us out at the first, at the beginning, by thinking about what are the requirements, the better the end result is going to be. It's the old cliche, right? Pay me now, pay me later. If you don't want to pay me up front, if you don't want to put the time in up front, you're going to do it later when you're putting out all the fires because... Jim's device doesn't work and Bob's device doesn't work and Sally's device doesn't work. Put the time in in front. It'll seem like it's, it's OCD, whatever you want to call it. It will pay dividends. And the final thing I forgot about this one was applications and intent. You know, what are your clients actually going to be? We talk about intent based networking and I'm like, we've always done intent based networking, except we've just, you know, always been like, what's the intentions of the person holding the device? You know, what are they going to do with that? You know, if you're talking about bars, barcode scanners and only barcode scanners, then that application and the intention of what they're going to be doing with it is totally different than if we talk about a guest network in um, any other type of scenario. And I was like, what, what's, what are you people? And John referenced this. You can go into your stuff today and you can find out like, Hey, what are the applications that are being most used, which application uses the most bandwidth and most data, you can go find this information and then you can figure out. So at that point you go, Hey, you know what? We didn't realize this. The majority of our, our traffic is all the YouTube. 
or it's all to Netflix or it's all your, know, or it's going internal or it's, you can find out all this information if you just think to go look for it. And then when you can give that information type, this information of, Hey, what do we want to do? How do we want to do it? What clients we're going to have? And then what are these clients going to do on our network? If you can provide that information ahead of time, if you have that information gathered when you sit down with your consultants or your VARs or your SEs, and you can say, this is what we've come up with, all of a sudden it gives them that massive head start in coming up with a solution for you that is going to make your stuff better. 100%. I mean, at the end of the day, no two networks are going to be the same. I mean, I we both have run uh, wireless mm -hmm. networks. And we've both run wireless networks over multiple buildings. And what worked in building A did not work in building B, wasn't required in building C. They might look the same, but you know, like you said, um, you could have a different, I mean, different guest networks are, are gonna require different things, right? The guest network in, an, in a corporation just needs to get somebody on the internet for their email while they're waiting for their interview or their meeting. The guest network at a hotel, that's the lifeblood of that network because they want you to pay for the upcharge to get better internet. So it's mm -hmm. a completely different experience. And then obviously you've got, you know, the portal pages and the walled gardens and so on and so forth. It's a rabbit hole that we could go down. We could spend two hours talking about all these things and we, we just don't have the time, but it's important. It's imperative to find out what they're doing, what your customer wants to do and what they want to do on it or what they want to do it on, you know, device, application, purpose, and yeah. build to it. A, a hospital is going to require a different level of networking than a business. Uh, a business mm -hmm. is going to require a different level of networking than a warehouse. You know, this the, the, we we pick on the zebra scanners all the time. They really don't have a huge requirement. It's make sure that they can connect. They're very robust. They're very like low. I don't want to call them low tech, but they're very. I mean, their bandwidth requirements are very minimal typically. Um, and you mm -hmm. mentioned, and I'll, I'll close with this. I had a warehouse. Nobody told me that they the previous design. I didn't have access to previous design. It was on a, on a controller that nobody had the codes to. They were near an airport within five miles, and the prior deployment had just d deleted, d disabled the DFS channels. I didn't know about it. Nobody knew about it. No, it was like, like lost in the ether. We turned everything on. We used every channel. That's my policy is kind of use everything until you know you can't. Turned it on Monday morning. Everything's looking good except for the warehouse, which, by the way, is 90% of this building. They're like, we can't scan in like most of the warehouse. So I take out my air check and I look under and same point as, as your daughter and our granddaughter in the switch. The APs in the warehouse happen to be the ones in the building that went to the DFS channels, which, oh, by the way, were the ones that the five gigahertz scanners didn't support. So as soon as mm -hmm. I changed the channel plan, we moved things around, everything was fine. Uh, but again, pay me now, pay me later. Um, you know, it might take you a day of meetings with clients. They're going to be annoyed but it's, it's important. You want stuff to work. So you got another requirements. Yep. So teaser for the oh, next one. Oh, oh I, I clicked away too soon. Teaser for the next one. I don't even know what the next one is. And it starts with an it. Are we talking about a Stephen yeah. King book? No. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm pretty, I'm also pretty certain that it's not, it depends. So we just covered so that like three times. So, <laughs> well, it all, it look, it depends fits into all of these. So, yeah, so that's, um, again, we can talk about every single, we could talk about every single one. And for the most part, it's what we do as professionals. We end up talking about all of these things all day. We just end up bouncing around the list. I know what it and is. Do, what? It's, it slices and dices, doesn't it? It does. Oh, and for the for limited, for limited time only, you can get it for half off. <laughs> And if you order in the next 10 minutes, yeah, I will, I will throw in a sham. Wow. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> oh, all right. What's the guy's name? Billy Evans right. or whatever his name was. I, he, he, he's no longer with us. And that's why I said was, so, was, uh, so. all righty. I think we've, we, it took us like 40 minutes to go off the rails, Mr. Palmer. So credit to us. Oh no. We started early going off the rails and jumping off the roof into snow, buddy. I didn't count that. I don't know why. Maybe that's a, that could oh, be that's off the rails. But anyway, that's anyways. off the rails. Go back and listen to it. I, I, I have nothing else for this one. We can, we can wrap this nope. up. I know, I know you've got a, a lunch uh, buddy waiting for you. Yep. Um, Sharon, I'm on my way. And uh, <laughs> with that, everybody, we'll uh, we'll see everybody on the next episode. See you guys. If you want to contact the show directly, you can email us using the address ruckcast 
at comscope.com. To learn more about Ruckus products and services that we may have talked about on this or any other podcast, please check the links in the About section of the show.